Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our Singapore FinTech Festival 2020. This is our Green Shoots channel, and coming right up, we have a panel discussion on Block Show, not just a bet, alternative investments with blockchain and cryptos. For this, we're pleased to have Mr. Dan Morhead, founder and chief executive officer of Pantera Capital, Ms. Meltem Demiris, chief strategy officer of CoinShares, Mr. Clement Yeeb, Chief Executive Officer of Genesis Block. And to moderate the session, we have Mr. Pradihumna Agrawal from Tamasa International, Singapore. Uh, excited to be live here. A very, very special thank you for our panelists. Uh, Clement, in particular to you for waking up early in the morning. It's 5 a.m., so big shout out to Clement here in the Asian time zone. And Meltem, who is still trading or has finished trading on the markets, and we were just discussing why it doesn't make sense. Anyway, thank you guys. Very warm welcome. Anything you want to say as opening comments on your side? Uh, I don't think the introduction will do justice to you guys. So Meltem, anything on your side to add from your background? Uh, I mean, look, I just want to start by saying uh, before we started this discussion, we were just chatting about how silly it is that um, you know I'm accustomed to trading in the crypto markets 24/7, and uh, whenever I trade in legacy markets, having to hit the 4 p.m. close is quite the contrast. <laughs> so. It is funny. We must change that, and we will change it. Clement, well, you're you're changing it in Singapore. So. Oh yes, we are. Yeah, we we were lucky for Ravi Menon to announce the new multi-currency payments network being set up here. And we've got to change the capital market. So it will happen. It'll happen. It'll happen faster than the US. That's all I will say. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having us, Patty. Um, it is early here, but you know, like uh, crypto doesn't stop. So thanks for having us. Yeah, awesome. So I, I really hope as we look back at this discussion today, we are not once again at a peak, which is going into hiatus for a few years. So this is really, really timely as a conversation. Uh, looking forward to your insights. Uh, so just as a reminder to everyone, uh, we are discussing today uh, once again the boom that we're seeing on the blockchain side and the crypto assets. And there's a raging debate, but a much more mature one, if I may say, on uh, crypto assets becoming an asset class truly on their own. So maybe just on that note, I'll start, uh, you know, Clement, what is different this time? Uh, there is a lot of conversation on are we going on a roller coaster once again? Would love to hear because you see a lot of flow, uh, your insights on this. Yeah, so um, we run uh, ATMs in Hong Kong and uh, Taiwan. We operate an OTC desk where uh, we trade with clients and we also run a prop desk. So I guess high level summary 2013, what we saw was um, massive uh, uh, inflows coming in. Uh, mainly coming from China, uh, 2017, but that was mainly Bitcoin. 2017, we saw a lot of the ICO boom where uh, it was a mixture between uh, Southeast Asia, Korea in particular. Uh, these are all retails. There was massive arbitrage, 40% in Korea, 20% in India, that sort of thing in 2017. Uh, a lot of retail were, were, were in 2013 and 2017 bull runs. Uh, this wave, we're heading towards like all-time high. In fact, I think we, we just touched all-time high about a week ago. Uh, we are not seeing retail. Uh, same with like you know Google Trends. We're looking at those numbers. Um, we're nowhere as as high as 2017 uh, when people with these keywords on Bitcoin and uh, you know buy Bitcoin. So we think what we're seeing is uh, some serious buyers coming in. Uh, these are judges, these are lawyers, these are partner levels of accounting firms. Um, ATM hasn't gone up that much in terms of volume. Um, nothing particular, nothing so significant. Been talking to other counterparties as well. Um, we're doing better than, you know, third quarter, but uh, the OTC flow in terms of volumes and ticket sizes is like similar ticket size around the year, but the ticket size are getting bigger. So these are the high net worth individuals. These are uh, more serious people trying to get in accumulate, uh, accumulating on, on, on Bitcoin particularly. And this is just Bitcoin um, and not, you know, the alternative currencies. So that's a very nuanced insight, right? Because the very generic criticism is always going to be around the retail activity. 
Uh, is there actually a way in which, Clement, someone can simply be able to glean some of these insights publicly just for the benefit of our audience? Um, sorry, what do you mean? Like, is there is there like a portal where you can just kind of aggregate and see what kind of activity we're seeing between institutional, retail? It's possible in some of the traditional asset classes. I mean, I think a good indication also is like um, with the grayscale Bitcoin, I mean, the the volume there is growing um, across all the top tier exchanges, which um, you have uh, Coinbase, you have Bitstamp, you have Binance, OKX will be, you know, um, volume has been picking up slowly for the last two quarters. Um, so, yeah. yeah. It'd, be great if, it'd be great if there's some product, actually, it's product idea of someone helping give deeper insights on these kind of flows as opposed to having to get you and Meltem on a panel. Uh, I, I will say, if I can advertise a little bit, um, we actually publish we, on a weekly basis a fund flows report that shows all of the inflows and outflows into structured products, so primarily crypto ETPs, since we operate um, Europe's largest um, ETP family. Uh, you know, we publish this weekly report. It's cited in a lot of media, but there you can actually see in real time how much inflow is going into different products, whether that's Grayscale, our product, XBT provider, or a variety of new products that have come onto the market in the last year. Uh, so that's one data point that I think is really helpful. And then Cambridge um, University in the UK does publish an annual report that provides a lot of useful and very nuanced sort of data on trends around uh, cryptocurrency usage holdings. And so they just updated their uh, 2020 report with some new data. So if anyone's interested, I think that's another great resource. Unfortunately, it's not updated in real time, um, but I do think it's insightful. And then lastly, there's a new service called uh, skew.com, uh, which is a great website that looks at flows across exchanges. One trend we track a lot, Prati, is the amount of Bitcoin being held on exchanges versus Bitcoin moving off exchanges. And one of the crazy trends we've seen this quarter actually is Bitcoin is moving off of exchanges. And so that to us is an interest, interesting indicator um, that people who are in the market are not looking to trade volatility, but potentially, right? And this is all inference. We're trying to infer a, a causal relationship here. But to us, Bitcoin moving at exchanges and the amount of Bitcoin on exchanges being at a two-year low is indicative of the fact that a lot of people who are adding exposure are choosing to migrate that exposure either to self-custody or a custodian or um, put it into long-term storage, which in my view is really supportive of the narrative Clement describes where we really see people who are engaging with Bitcoin being more serious buyers who are really thinking about it as a portfolio allocation strategy as opposed to maybe uh, traders and firms who are looking to take advantage of a, a local sort of period of uh, high volatility. No, I, I think this is great. Uh, this is just for our audience as they listen to this right now, or probably much later in the video recording. So do take note of that. So just on that note, Maldem, it would be great to, um, coming from an institutional investor and an organization which has traditionally taken a more fundamental value view uh, to any asset class or any individual uh, stocks, uh, any proxy for stocks that we've held, would be great very briefly if you could uh, share some insights on the kind of frameworks that you're seeing emerge. Um, it is it is still emerging, but it's very difficult for someone like me actually to think about, hey, uh, you, can, you can try and build some causal relationship as you say, uh, but if I were to just put some framework to look and say, what will actually drive the value? We all understand the underlying arguments of this being a hedge, blah, blah, blah. It would be great to get your inputs on that. Yeah. Sure. So evaluation is a topic that comes up a lot, and specifically evaluation methodology. We have hosted a number of workshops with CFOs and um, with uh, the CFA Institute around crypto asset valuation, where crypto fits in a portfolio, uh, portfolio allocation strategies. So this is an important conversation. Uh, my background, I come from the commodities industry. So the model that we find resonates well, and actually it's interesting, a lot of people in crypto either come from FX or commodities, <laughs> because I think if you've traded FX or commodities, right, you're accustomed to sort of thinking through models where you're thinking about supply, demand, and sort of uh, global flows. So uh, the one model that 
that's been uh, really interesting, and there are a few permutations of this, is the stock to flow model. And in fact, interestingly, today at SALT, which is a large global asset management conference um, hosted by Anthony Scaramucci, Anthony Scaramucci actually did a live session with uh, Plan B, who is an anonymous person on Twitter, who is the author of the stock to flow model. So it just goes to show you what a weird world we're living in <laughs> in the year 2020. Um, so stock to flow is a model that basically attempts to uh, look at supply and, and demand. The great thing about Bitcoin and modeling Bitcoin is that the supply schedule of Bitcoin is fixed. It's programmatic. We can map it out. 85% of all Bitcoin that will ever exist have already been mined. So uh, we have an understanding of what the daily, weekly, monthly, annual supply is through our fund flows report and through public announcements like that of Square and MicroStrategy and today Mass Mutual, the insurance company buying Bitcoin, we understand demand. And so we see consistently week after week, quarter after quarter, the amount of demand for Bitcoin is outpacing supply that's coming into the market through the production of new, newly mined Bitcoin. So this gives us an indication of sort of uh, where we might expect the valuation to go, which again, a lot of demand, not a whole lot of supply. What happens to P? P goes up. That's one model. Um, other models that have been attempted is more of an FX model, which is an MV equals PQ model. Um, this model, I'm not as big of a fan of. I, intuitively, it doesn't make as much sense to me. Um, and I think another thing that confuses the, the velocity argument for modeling Bitcoin's price is there is um, a lot of synthetic money in the crypto ecosystem in the form of Tether or USDC or now fully sort of decentralized stable coins that I think make it difficult to gauge the actual velocity of money. There's a lot of activity that's happening off venue. There's batching of transactions. And so it's, it's a more difficult model to apply and intuitively. Um, but those are really the two predominant models. It's a commodity focused kind of supply demand stock to flow model, or it's more of an FX focused flows focused MV equals PQ model where you're looking at the velocity of money. Um, so those are the predominant models we've used. Uh, in the next few weeks, we'll be publishing an outline of the four different valuation methodologies. So coinshares.com, we publish all our research there. Um, so that's something we have been working on from a research side as well. Interesting, interesting. So uh, maybe just moving on to the next theme, right? I, I was hoping to divide this discussion into three parts. We've spoken about some of the activity, what's driving value, what are the frameworks we can use. Uh, let's talk a little about the real world utility. And I'm personally a massive proponent of the store of value aspect of it is extremely important. I'm not in any way belittling that. It's actually driven a lot of the innovation around the space and that thinking is now translating into real world use cases. I mean, we see that uh, even though we may not be investing directly in the asset class. Uh, as the Masek, the uh, would love to get a perspective. Uh, maybe Clement, you want to go first on this on utility. What sure. are the potential breakout use cases that can help accelerate value beyond obviously interest in this as a new asset class? Uh, uh, any thoughts from you, Clement? Yeah, so, I mean, what we saw was, um, obviously, Bitcoin is like 11 years old. It started off with uh, a small group of people that really believe in Bitcoins. And, you know, we know quite a few people that uh, are true Bitcoiners or like complete maximalists where they actually don't have bank accounts or they have is Bitcoin. And with Bitcoin nowadays, like you can actually buy, you, you can travel around the world with Bitcoin only. Uh, a lot of uh, everywhere in the world, you will be able to find someone that can do a peer-to-peer -peer trade with, for you to trade the, 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 the Bitcoin to local currency. So those people already exist. Um, and I guess 2017, 2018, um, it was sort of like the born of uh, stable coins um, with Tether. And the last, what I want to mention is like the last two years or in, in 2019, it was a year of staple coins. So it wasn't just Tether, but you know, we had uh, USDC, TUSD, um, really try and uh, uh, um, in terms of like the whole blockchain uh, sort of um, transactions across Ethereum, for example, they, they, they probably accounted for more than 50% of all the transactions. And, what we're seeing in China, for example, is like um, a group of these money exchangers, these people that used to move money, uh, they're, they're brokers of uh, renminbi to HKD or renminbi to US dollar. 
they're really starting to use Tether um, or stablecoin to um, move money out. Yeah. And these people have come into the space this year dabbling into Ethereum, dabbling into DeFi. Um, and these people are talking to us, like we trade with them. They're the ones that trust you know, their wallet, trust Tether, trust Stablecoin more than uh, the, the fiat currency in their, in their bank account. Where in China, you know, their, their bank account can be frozen for like forever. Uh, and this happens all the time. I think Q3, Q4, a lot of people got their bank account frozen, not because they were doing illegal activity, but their bank accounts got sent some dirty money. Um, so we're seeing a lot more of this, and this is not just China, this is like Malaysia, this is Singapore, Indonesia. We're seeing more people actually start using crypto, using stablecoin, and like their entry to cryptocurrencies and blockchain is actually because of uh, stablecoin, which is like, you know, supposed to be pegged to the US dollar. Um, and they're st starting to dabble into uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum through this wave. So so if I make Clement, just on that, right? Uh, if I pick up that thread and a specific use case, essentially what you're saying is it's also fiction in payments, whether it's domestic or cross-border. Um, is essentially what I'm taking away from your comments. Uh, what will need to happen uh, for this to be accepted by regulators? And this just may be sheer force of market share. Uh, just what will what will give this regulatory acceptance in a major market? It doesn't have to be everyone. Uh, I think it's going to be pretty difficult to stop this. I mean, what we saw no, yesterday. I'm, I'm asking a very pointed question. I'm not saying what will stop it, right? This is a force yeah. of nature in, as a sector now. Uh, I'm not I'm not debating that. I'm asking what will the take for the regulators to accept it? To accept it. Um, I and think there's... Smiling, can't stop yeah. smiling. But then feel free to jump in as well. Yeah, why don't you take a punt at this? Like, I, I think they're already accepting it now, slowly. Um, you see officially. The officially. Uh, uh, oh. I beg to differ. I think it very much depends what jurisdiction you're in. Yeah. So if you're in the good, have the good fortune of you know being in in Singapore and having MAS, who's been very forward thinking, I think you're in a much better environment than if you're in the U.S. Where right now. Oh, you know, you're still not answering the question. MAS has not officially endorsed it, right? Uh, yeah. What will get official endorsement? <clears throat> Uh, I think official endorsement will come when uh, so many people are using the system and so many organizations are using the system uh, that they have to do something. Like in the, I sit in the U.S., so the biggest issue we're facing in in the U.S. right now is um, there are only a few banks that have access directly to the Fed, right? And so, um, you know, I was just complaining. You know, T plus two, T plus three is the reality for most people. I have forgotten that it takes three days to transfer money in the US because I've been so accustomed to using USDC or uh, crypto synthetic dollars that I can send within two seconds. <laughs> it's like mind boggling to me that it takes three days to send money. But, but look, at the end of the day, the only thing that gets regulators to move is when the large corporations start to move. And at the end of the day, this is about taxation control um, and making sure that there's sufficient monitoring. And so I think for most uh, regulators, right now, you know, this is still very small in comparison to other parts of the financial market. Crypto is still very, very minuscule, right? So it really takes time for this to grow. And as the volumes grow, I think it becomes a more relevant concern. Okay, interesting. So I think you guys have basically talked about movement of money and the barbarians being at the door in sufficiently large volumes for them. To Wait, are we the barbarians or is the legacy system the barbarian? Well, for people to actually realize that something is much better, right? So what do you mean? I, what, Prati, if I may, I'd like to go ahead and say that we are the Galactic Federation, right? So okay. we're the aliens. So we're coming to Earth with our beautiful money system. If you had if you had actually done that, you'd have done nice backgrounds to just make the point more visually uh, <laughs> of this panel. But beyond, beyond sort of movement of money, which is a real friction point, right? Yeah. Uh, Anything else that you guys are seeing outside the financial services space as utility emerging out of the sector in a meaningful way? I, I can 
can add two brief examples, Prati, if I may. Uh, one is still in, in financial services, but starts to migrate beyond. And look, the primary function of most of the financial sector is to do two things. It's to securitize assets um, and to extend leverage, right? So one of the interesting things that's happening is people are now able to use crypto native primitives to use real world collateral and make it liquid and allow people to obtain leverage against that collateral. So one example is trading cards, right? I don't know if anyone here has ever collected trading cards or Beanie Babies or Pogs or any sort of collectible. I know I have a large Beanie Baby collection at my parents' house, which my mom always likes to tease me about when I go home. But um, if you are someone who collects collectibles, historically, you know, you own your collectibles, they sit in your house, and there's really no way for you to borrow money against your collectibles. There are now a bunch of different um, companies that are moving collectibles online or making real world collectibles like classic cars, um, digital collateral and securitizing them and then allowing people to use their fractional ownership of a collectible item to obtain real cash leverage. I think that's pretty exciting. Like every asset in the world can now become collateral for capital markets, um, which is a really interesting concept. And then it can go very esoteric from there. You know, what if you could tokenize your reputation? What if you could tokenize, you know, relationships? There's all sorts of weird, funny ways you could apply that. But think of, you know, art markets, think of real estate markets. There are a lot of different ways that people are securitizing and then using that securitization to enable lending. So that's one trend. And then the second trend that's sort of an extensions of that extension of that that I've been spending a lot of time on is the financialization of compute and connectivity. Today, most models for consuming compute and connectivity are sort of um, done on a contractual basis because it's very difficult to pay as you go or to meter bandwidth. But Ethereum is effectively a network that prices compute, uh, right, in the form of gas and transaction fees for deploying a smart contract. So we're actually starting to see traditional enterprises in the compute and connectivity space looking for ways to leverage um, what's happening in the crypto space to facilitate pay-as-you-go models um, and to sort of innovate around how compute and connectivity is delivered today. And there's a big CapEx, OpEx cash flow timing mismatch, right? Like building a data center or building an ISP takes years and it requires billions of dollars of capital. So what you're seeing also is innovative new financing models that bring new types of asset-backed lending into infrastructure projects focused on compute and connectivity. Interesting, very interesting. I think you may have spoken to someone in my team because one of the use cases that's closest to my heart is actually linked to digital assets, in particular in the gaming space. It is an absolutely mind-blowing use case for the technology. And I have to say I'm very surprised that it hasn't taken off in scale. Uh, so just as we sort of move on, I just want to uh, sound out the SFF team. Uh, I don't think the speakers might be showing up on the screen, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm a speaker, so I can't see the audience view here. In any case, so uh, if you could fix that, please, if it's happening. If not, then just ignore my comment. Uh, so in moving sort of on that same thread, um, uh, uh, what I would say, uh, what I'm seeing a little bit, I, I know I'm the moderator here, but <laughs> I'll just add a little bit of perspective on this, is that uh, there is obviously the whole store of value use case, uh, but just truly, a lot of that decentralized technology, we are beginning to see actual use cases emerge, especially around things like data and identity. And I think you refer to that, Milton. And that has very broad application. And it actually does not need to sound as anarchic in some people's perspectives, because all it's doing is it's taking away the need for some of these centralized institutions. And quite often, actually, uh, the public institutions are okay, at least for my lens, uh, but the private institutions can profit uh, and extract rent disproportionately. And this in many ways may, is actually beginning to allow data to flow more freely in, in, in the use cases. And it is great because while all the focus is on Bitcoin and ETH prices right now and trading on that, there is actual utility that's beginning to emerge. So uh, it's fantastic. I'm glad that you guys are seeing it as well. Uh, <clears throat> awesome. So just moving on, uh, on that same theme, uh, uh, I know when we were chatting ahead, uh, there was a view from Clement and Melton, you guys, on just the underlying business models. Uh, uh, if you sort of take a derivative of the actual asset class, there is a lot of unicorns emerging, but mainly financial intermediaries. Uh, and, and I would love 
for the sake of the audience for you to share a perspective on um, how should we think of these business models compared to SaaS, compared to broader sort of the technology space, including maybe uh, things like fintech. Yeah, I, I can kick this one off. I spent a lot of time thinking about this, writing about this, and um, I've invested in over 250 companies over the last six years. Uh, so <laughs> I've spent a lot of time thinking about business models. Um, in my view, one of the challenges with, with crypto is we're trying to disintermediate financial institutions, but at the same time, you know, crypto businesses need to make money. And so um, the predominant model today is the banking business model where you charge transaction fees for facilitating access to blockchain networks and blockchain assets. Um, you internalize the custody fee or you're able to pass it on to institutional clients who store in size. And then you, um, really, this hasn't happened so much yet, but it's starting to happen. We see rehypothecation where people take assets that are deposited and then lend them out to earn a yield. And then in some cases they pass that yield on to, to their clients. This is the predominant model of several large uh, lenders in the US who've created a multi-billion dollar marketplace for this type of asset backed crypto collateral backed lending. So the predominant model we've seen and most of the unicorns in the crypto space today are financial intermediaries. They're effectively banks built around crypto. Now, with some of the business models that I think are more interesting on the enterprise SaaS side is um, really what Bitcoin is. It's a giant telecommunication network. Um, all we're doing is we're communicating value, right? And so I think some of the business models around providing access to the network and then um, arbitraging inefficiencies in the physical Bitcoin network are really interesting. So these are things like hash rate swaps and other sort of compute and connectivity derivatives that are emerging. Um, so the financialization of compute is something we've long been really interested in and passionate about. And we see that happening in, at scale now. And then the last business model that's you know being experimented with here is the the token business model, where if you create a network and the token you know allows people to somehow participate in the network either in the form of governance or having access to, you know, being able to do compute on the network um, like with Ether, we've seen that business model be really successful in in some instances. Although I think there's still a lot of unanswered questions because we don't yet have mental models or theoretical frameworks for how these business models should function. But I think there are a lot of signs of, you know, early winners and early successes in that sort of model. You know, Ether has a $25 billion market cap. That to me is a pretty clear sign that people, you know, and people are using Ether in transactions on a day-to-day -day basis. They're using Ether as, as gas um, to fuel compute on the Ethereum network. So I think this is one interesting early example of tokenized business models. Yeah, so what would be great, Martin, is if I may, Take the liberty is if veterans like yourselves can also talk on this kind of uh, <clears throat> utility that you're seeing in emerge business models that are seeing to emerge uh, more often, right? I think the focus shifts too much sometimes on the price and the store of value, which I, I agree is not as an established norm yet. So there's a need to get the word out there. Uh, Clement, would love to get your perspective, including what are you seeing from a China lens, and and you're uniquely placed. Uh, in this part of the world uh, uh, in terms of business models emerging there? Yeah, so I mean, apart from um, people obviously started with, a lot of people started using Tether. I mean, Tether went from like 3 billion to now it's like 18 billion cap. Um, and they're starting to shift into, so this year is the year of DeFi, right? We it started off with Compound and all these different protocols. So, um, they're actually, what we're seeing is like they're also learning about how to get yield um, uh, on Ethereum using their stable coin to get, you know, right now it's like not much, 3%, 4%, but on top of if they, if they leverage that, you know, they're getting like double digit yields. Probably not that anymore, but like easily like 6 to 7% yields um, interacting with, you know, these uh, decentralized protocols where their only risk is smart contract risk, but uh, we're seeing more and more people um, starting to do that. And um, another place is like Uniswap providing liquidity. Um, again, we're seeing these it's these people that didn't don't have any Bitcoin. They started with USDT, um, helping people, facilitating people with moving money. Uh, a lot of the times in China is like these brokers are actually holding their clients' money as well and um, they're giving them ideas on 
how this is like a safe option for them to generate some yield on the assets that they have. They're happy with the US dollars. Um, obviously, I don't think they quite understand like the risk on uh, these stable coins. Um, but, you know, they're interacting with the blockchain and, you know, it's fascinating to see. I mean, we're, we're doing this all the time as well. And it's fascinating to see these people went from using it to just move money to now really using the blockchain to uh, generate yield for themselves. No, I think I think the whole DeFi phenomenon. In fact, uh, uh, as our audience would have noticed, Dan is not been on the screen, and I've been actually exchanging uh, notes with him on the side. Uh, I, I think I made quite an art of not looking distracted while I'm actually doing other things on Zoom in the last nine months, if nothing else. Uh, uh, so he actually had a perspective share as well here, which I just want to make sure our audience uh, hears, which is uh, <coughs> there is movement of money. There's DeFi, uh, there's there's ability to extract yield, as you're talking about, Clement, uh, but also a lot of the underlying infrastructure. Uh, so he's he shared with us one example, which some people be aware of, uh, but, uh, but just just for more broad consumption, like Filecoin, where uh, Dan believes it can be the next generation marketplace for data storage, uh, a true sort of peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, uh, and actually it could. Uh, uh, rival centralized solutions for Dan, like AWS. And it's, it's fascinating, I mean, leaving aside the specific companies, right, where you have so much uh, underutilized infrastructure and uh, more importantly, efficiency that can be brought in the system uh, through some of these solutions again. So we're, but, I just want that. But Prati, to be fair, everything we've just described is primarily two things. It's one thing, actually. Yeah. We're taking things and securitizing them, right? What Filecoin is doing is taking underutilized storage capacity and securitizing it in an on-chain way and then allowing people to obtain leverage against it. That's really all we're, we're doing here is we're discovering a way to programmatically securitize things that have historically been too esoteric or too small scale to securitize through the traditional financial system and then making it available as collateral and extending leverage against it. Like at its core, these are the two principles at play, whether that's in compute and connectivity, whether that's in capital markets, whether that's in gaming, you know, all we're doing is we've found a really efficient way to securitize things and we're now able to extend leverage against these assets because they're they're secure collateral where we can actually assign custody to other people, whether that's in some sort of escrow that's done on chain or in an actual transfer of, of ownership. That's yeah. it. And, and we're actually converting everything into true digital native format. And therefore, you can talk of it in the same breath as the capital markets, right? And I think that's a, you've hit the nail on the head, which is a point that a lot of people are still missing um, as to what the technology can do. So while you may still not be able to convince an institution like the mask to go buy crypto right now, uh, we would look at the utility and the use cases. And you know, each one on their own uh, will drive value for the broader space uh, in terms of actual uses. So, well, also, well Prati, rest assured that I will not rest until I'm able to- I really hope you don't. I really hope I, you don't actually. I will not rest until I'm able to securitize myself and have people like Clement extend me leverage on my <laughs> reputation. So I will not rest. So Clement, it's if you want to bid me, I'm open open for business. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about this. If you guys are going to start resting, I worry about the energy uh, that is driving this space, which goes beyond what's in the technology lens. Okay, so just to wrap it up, right, we've got five minutes to go here, guys. Um, you actually started touching uh, on uh, a couple of points, which uh, would be great to move beyond the Bitcoin narrative, uh, coming back to the original theme. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the importance of ETH. And uh, I don't know, 90% plus of the narrative is still on Bitcoin, which is great. I mean, that's perfectly fine. That's most visible. And what are we seeing on the layer one level? And what is emerging there? And what will sustain? Or is ETH now the layer one solution? And uh, uh, I, I know there are very strong views on this. So I look forward to a very open sharing here. <laughs> I'll just kick it off really quickly by saying I think Bitcoin is very unique in the pantheon of cryptocurrencies. It has attributes that cannot be replicated. And the thing that is most unique about Bitcoin is if we never change a single line of code in the Bitcoin protocol, it will continue to function 
just as intended. So in many ways, I view Bitcoin really as a, a finished product. Really, when it was first, you know, brought into inception 11 years ago, and the network mined its first block, Bitcoin was a, a finished product. Um, whereas I think, you know, ETH and, and other protocols, ETH is undergoing a major, major shift. It's migrating from proof of work to proof of stake, right? $25 billion protocol, like changing its consensus algorithm <laughs> while in flight is is a very different value proposition. I believe there's plenty of room for, for other layer ones and, and valuable protocols to emerge. But I think when it comes to sound money principles and um, security of the network, I think Bitcoin stands in a pantheon all of its own. It's a separate asset class and Bitcoin really is its own very unique construction that nobody will ever be able to, to replicate. I, I, I don't dispute that, but can I build on Bitcoin? Can I build my businesses on Bitcoin? Absolutely, 100%. Can you elaborate on that? Because most of us don't relate to that. Sure. Uh, so look, the number that gets thrown around is Bitcoin can only um, process seven transactions per second. There are now uh, new innovations on top of Bitcoin. So Lightning Network um, extends Bitcoin into layer two. So there are all of these uh, sort of innovations getting built around Bitcoin that instead of uh, tampering with the core protocol and changing the parameters of the core protocol, what happens in Bitcoin is the core protocol is sacrosanct. It's not changed. And all of the innovation is relegated to sort of layer twos. Um, so innovations happen putting on a, a separate layer that anchor back to the core Bitcoin blockchain, but don't tamper with any attributes of, of that. Um, whereas I think in other protocols, there's more of an openness to changing the actual core protocol itself. Um, and so again, you know, there are different ways of building and extending um, Bitcoin as an asset. And I am very convinced that a lot of these protocols for attempting extensibility at the base layer are going to run into interesting challenges. We've already seen various consensus bugs. We've seen forks <laughs> happen, right? Unintentional forks as a result of breaks in consensus. And so again, I think um, Bitcoin's approach here is much more conservative, which I think is appropriate for the state of maturity it's in as a $350 billion protocol. Um, and you know, we have insurance companies, publicly listed corporations, and um, governments holding Bitcoin as treasury asset. Like tampering with the core protocol at this stage would be unwise in my view. Thank you, Milton. Clement, any, what are you seeing Hong Kong, Greater China, in Asia, mobility? Yeah, so I mean, Bitcoin by far is still, it's, it, it trumps everything else um, in the space. But um, what's interesting, I guess, other layer ones that we're seeing is, um, you know, Solana is uh, a blockchain that we feel very promising. We've made plenty of investments um, on top, like on other uh, projects that are building on top of, um, Solana, um, mainnet just launched, you know, two, three months ago. And uh, one thing that's extremely interesting is like, you know, we've been trying on Ethereum for quite a long time. Um, there is scalability issues um, with DeFi boom in the last, this, this entire year, like the network was really jammed where transaction fees were, you know, $20, $20 up to $20 just to make a trans transaction. So that's that's going to be challenging for Ethereum. But, you know, there is a roadmap. It's probably going to take like, you know, two to three years for that upgrade, um, as Melton mentioned. Um, so we're, we're also actively looking at other layer one. So um, and one particular dimension is like Solana for us. Um, we think oh. it's very, quite promising. Well, that's interesting. I mean, it, we, we, we ourselves are seeing quite a preponderance of layer ones. And again, just to get input in from Dan, uh, who's not here live with us, uh, but has actually been contributing content here. And, and he's calling out Polkadot. Uh, and putting aside the fact that I think they're investors in Polkadot, I will say that uh, uh, it, the scalability issue that you've referred to um, are, is being solved by folks like Polkadot. Uh, it's just now that the toolings need to be put in place to, as Dan says, launch decentralized applications on it. Um, and if they can execute against it, then we will see more competition for Ethereum, and which is good for the space, really, right? But but to be yeah. fair, it, it's all about where the, the liquidity flows. And right now, the liquidity is number one on Bitcoin, number two, Ether. Every other chain it's, is bridging its way back to Ethereum by wrapping their tokens and putting them on top of Ethereum, right? Yeah. That is where the liquidity is. And I think that like liquidity is king, always is, always will be, always has awesome. been. So that's a super conclusion. And with that, we'll wrap up our discussion today. Thank you guys for being awesome panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pradi. Thank you, Pradi.